So today we're going to go through a presentation from John Andrews, the CEO of Collective Bias, and um, he's joined us here in the Mars Filter office in Toronto, and he's going to talk a little bit about some of the trends from 2011, uh, looking at social media and shopper marketing, and then he's going to touch on six of his 12 key trends for 2012, and I believe that's a blog post that just went up on the blog today. So I'm going to turn it over to John Andrews, and he's going to take us through some slides. So go. thank you, Janine, and I appreciate uh, Mars Filter having us and hosting us today. Um, first trend of 2012 is don't use Keynote in uh, go to meeting <laughs> uh, presentations because evidently uh, those uh, platforms have stopped talking to each other and don't like each other. No, thank you for um, thank you for having us today, and I'd like to be. Um, very interactive in this in this presentation. Uh, we're going to be taking questions. We've got some questions that we preloaded that uh, people had given us uh, yesterday, and uh, so we'll go through those as uh, as an interactive rather than me droning on for an hour, yep. which I am capable of doing, but mm -hmm. uh, we'll choose not to. Yeah. So sorry for everyone on the call. Um, you can just use the the dashboard and just type in your questions there, and I'll be asking them to John throughout the presentation. And we will be having um, two polls as well. So you'll just notice that the slide presentation will go down, the poll will go up. We'll give you about 60 seconds and then we'll uh, present those answers. So thank you. Um, let me give a, just a minute of background uh, on myself. I am a, um, a marketer uh, by trade, a brand marketer. I've uh, been about 12 years in the brand marketing space, been about 12 years in the brand marketing space with brands such as uh, Legs, uh, which owned by Haynes Brands, uh, a little digital startup called Picture Vision, which became the backbone of America Online's You've Got Picture Service and uh, Kodak PhotoNet, um, Newell Rubbermaid, the Goody brand, and uh, M Plus Foot Care, which is a small brand uh, based in North Carolina. Um, about five years ago, I joined the Walmart food marketing team in uh, the Walmart headquarters at, uh, in Bentonville, Arkansas. Uh, working on uh, dry grocery and uh, cooperative marketing programs. Um, into that job, I was approached and asked if I would be interested in uh, creating and uh, leading a emerging media team. And I said, sure, what's emerging media? And as uh, Walmart uh, and, uh, defined it at the time, it was really anything beyond the digital uh, banner ad. You know. Um, uh, a lot of things were beginning to happen in, uh, in, in the media space. Twitter had just come out. Uh, people were using this thing called Facebook and uh, using uh, mobile applications on the, on the iPhone. And uh, it, it, you know, it was, uh, as most companies, I think, are experiencing, there were groups across the comp company doing different stuff. And so it was, let's try to create a coordinated effort and figure out how to do those, those things. Um, during that time, and we'll talk a little bit about the, the program that, uh, that, that we created there, uh, we created a social platform called the 11 Moms, uh, and, and we'll go through that, that process and then in today. And that is my um, Twitter profile at the bottom. If you're just dying to know more, you can, uh, you can go there as well. So let's talk about 11 Moms for a minute, because 11 Moms was an attempt, uh, my attempt to really begin to understand this space. I was a uh, consumer packaged goods marketer, really understood that process very well, um, really didn't know anything about this space. And uh, it, you know, in, a, in an attempt to learn more about the space, I began to do um, my investigation, as I would a, a marketer for any type of product, and understand how people were using new media tools. So uh, I think I might have had a Facebook account. I'd probably never used it at that point. Um, had a LinkedIn account like most people, so you know I could keep in touch with people when uh, it was time to find a new job. And uh, I, um, I, other than that, I probably had very little social presence. So you know, starting from scratch was great because I didn't have any preconceived notions, and I could learn what people were doing. As I began to do some investigation, I began to find that, um, gosh, there were an awful lot of people talking about Walmart's brand mission, which was saving money. And uh, these people were, were, were bloggers or, or, or different, different types of uh, you know, micro publishers in, in some format. Some were vloggers, video bloggers. And, and they were producing content on a regular basis about saving money, about couponing, about frugal living, about personal finance. And I said, gosh, this is, you know, this is, this is, very, uh, this is very exciting. And, and, and actually something that uh, really had always been in the back of my mind was the fact that a couple times prior to, to really have an organized approach. Walmart had stumbled a couple times. You might, uh, in the social space, you might remember a uh, campaign called um, 
Walmarting Across America, which was a blog about a couple who had just gotten married mm -hmm. and, um, and was going to take their motor home and stay in Walmart parking lots, which you may not realize is a benefit of Walmart. You're allowed to park an RV overnight in their parking lot for free. Um, and when you wake up in the morning, you have the world's largest uh, convenience store right outside <laughs> your door. Um, this is a kind of a great idea. You know, it's kind of kind of fun, except that it was not a real blog. Uh, this was uh, this was a, a figment of the imagination of the uh, uh, of one of the agencies of the company, and uh, it was quickly found out as uh, as blogs are, are quite transparent. And it uh, it was quickly um, included in a book by Josh Burnoff called Groundswell, which was one of the first books that I read about the space. And in fact, um, during my, my tenure uh, in Emerging Media at Walmart, I kept a sticky note on my cube that said um, GS30, which reminded me, um, be transparent, be open, because people are going to find out anyway. Uh, so this was heavy in my mind. So going back to 11 Moms and thinking mm -hmm. about how we could really understand what, um, it, it, you know, what is, what is the, the right way, and is there a right way, to, to use the emerging media space. And the 11 Moms really became uh, my lab to really understand it from the point of view of people who were actually creating content in the space. Uh, as fate would have it, we're sitting around the table one day having a discussion about the launch of the iPhone at Walmart and, and wondering what the purchase experience might be like. And uh, we had a suggestion, hey, why don't we, we take this, this group of uh, what, what now was 20 moms. Um, I don't really know the math between 20 and 11 moms and where the, where, where the name came from. But uh, we, uh, we were able to, um, to, to give these folks a, uh, a gift card and have them go along the path to purchase uh, to buy an iPhone from Walmart. And what was interesting is you began to see uh, many divergent paths of how people would actually uh, go and access a, uh, a, a purchase like an iPhone. And, and the bloggers, as bloggers are, are want to do, uh, recorded this process. So they, they, uh, they blogged about it. Uh, they captured images of the shopping experience via their smartphones or, or whatever devices they were using. Uh, they, they discussed it in, in groups and, and talked about, you know, the, the, the good and the bad of the experience. And what, what was very interesting is while the, the experience was fine, you know, the, the experience was, uh, was neither uh, exceptionally great or exceptionally bad, uh, the bloggers were really excited that someone was asking their opinion to really understand, uh, you know, how could I improve that experience? And that became a, a really kind of an aha moment for me of, gosh, as a brand marketer, you, you can really have this open pipeline to including um, vo the consumer's voice and the consumer's uh, uh, point of view in your, in your stories. Um, and so we began to actually formalize this process. And, and shortly after that period, uh, we launched a forward-facing uh, uh, version of the, the 11 Moms uh, as a way to um, begin to integrate this, uh, this consumer-generated content into the things that we were doing. And the first program that, that, we, had, uh, that we had done is uh, the launch of the Twilight DVD at Walmart and Associated Products. And, and it was great because, you know, we had big traditional media. We have a circular that reaches 80 million homes. You know, we had TV and print and radio and all the things that you, you, you would have. And then you had the point of view from, from the blog community and, the, and the, the content that they created about creating, having movie watching parties or how uh, they had read all the books or wanted to read all the books before they saw the movie or whatever their point of view may be that blended in on social spaces and social platforms uh, that, that information uh, along with that traditional media and it became a way to connect and really integrate all of the other media touch points from things that were happening on walmart.com to things that might be uh, in traditional media to, to new social spaces into a, a common theme. Move forward to the founding of Collective Bias and who we are and what we do. Uh, we are really, if you think about that 11 Moms model of, of having a network uh, of consumers with influence, um, that's the basis, that's the core of what we do at Collective Bias. Uh, we are a social shopper marketing company. We are really thinking about social media with the narrow view of how do we leverage that for uh, engagement along the path to purchase. So connecting a brand uh, conversation with a retail conversation specifically. 
We have a private network of uh, a little over 1,200 influencers today, uh, each with an average reach of about 25,000 people. And, and that network uh, in, in aggregate now has a, a combined reach of over 40 million people. Uh, we uh, have a suite of technology that we use uh, to um, really identify engagement streams along the path to purchase to create content about those, those activities and then to distribute that content. So we have a community platform called Social Fabric. It is a private network of, of bloggers. It's invitation only. Uh, it, it, uh, it exists uh, for the sole purpose of, of managing and connecting the network of these 1,200 folks. Within that network, uh, the, within that property, there are about 235 interest groups uh, based on retail preference, category preference, lifestyle preference, uh, and some self-directed groups that the, the members choose to participate in uh, based on the things that are important to them and to their networks. Uh, we have a data collection device, a, a mobile application called Loom that allows us to uh, capture stories uh, and, and capture the shopping experience as consumers are shopping along the path to purchase. So they're capturing images, they're capturing their thoughts about shopping processes, and I'll show you an example of that in a moment. Uh, and then we have a syndication tool called CB Socially that is uh, a set of 25 and growing uh, social uh, media echo ecosystems. You can think about them as a social magazine, and they usually exist. Uh, some combination of a Twitter stream, a uh, Facebook page, a Pinterest page, a YouTube page, and an aggregation site. And, and they, uh, they uh, uh, address themes such as uh, entertainment and couch, uh, with our Couch Critics group, or parenting, or gardening, or healthy living. And it's a way to take the content that is produced by the community and syndicate that. So you can really think about what we do is the ability to create a social media ad uh, very and, and place that in a consistent and, and reliable way that is similar to buying an ad on, on television or buying an ad on print. We, uh, on the back of those three systems, we have a shopper behavior database that allows us to really begin to look at what are shoppers doing in different channels and in different lifestyle groups and in different activities. And, and again, uh, just to reiterate, this is shoppers with influence. So we realize this is a special group but we are able to, to use this to say, gosh, we'd like to talk to shoppers at Target who are interested in DIY. What type of network do we, what type of network reach do we have in, in very specific activities? And it's, if you think about it, it's similar to a reverse segmentation process where instead of saying, we're trying to reach women who are 25 to 34, who are married, who have children, uh, we want to see, um, what, uh, who, who wants to participate in a conversation about a certain activity and then analyze the, the makeup of the group. In Canada, uh, we've begun our, our growth and outreach very similar to the, the way that we did in the United States. Um, of our 1,200 plus members today, 107 of those members are, are Canadian. Um, the reach of that group has exceeded a half million uh, with an average clout score, and we'll talk about clout in a, in a moment, of, uh, of 47. So it's an influential group. Uh, it's got some, uh, some pretty solid reach uh, uh, already, and we have a group of folks um, really representing each of the, uh, the Canadian provinces today. And so we are, are, are able to begin to do the same type of outreach in Canada that we do in the, uh, in the States. So I'll give you an example of a, uh, of a shop and give you an example of how the process really takes hold and, and what I think is interesting about social media today uh, as we go through this. So this is a shop that we did looking at a, um, a holiday uh, baking opportunity at, at um, uh, looking at ConAgra products. And in, in this activity, uh, one of our community members um, had a mission to create a, uh, a holiday recipe that uh, she was going to follow along in a shop. And in this case, we use Google Plus as the capture device. And you'll be able to follow the link when we share this, uh, this, this deck out, that you'll be able to follow this shopper's path throughout her journey. So you'll see that she has um, you know, selected a recipe from a uh, from, from a print mag from a set of print magazines. She's created a list. In this case, she's consulted a circular 
Uh, and, and keep in mind, each shop is different. She's gone along her path to purchase, to, to purchase items that are interesting to her. She's sharing her basket, the, the things that she, uh, that she chose. And then she's actually got use education. So as she uh, returns to her home, how she actually made uh, her, her meal and product. All of these things are being shared publicly via uh, Google Plus, which uh, indexes this conversation about hunts and Walmart in a, in a singular conversation. Off of this activity, the, the uh, community members would create content that, uh, that also included the path to purchase, which is a, you know, a big part of the brand experience as we look at it. So let's talk about the big trends uh, from 2011 and some of the big uh, upcoming trends from, from uh, 2012. Uh, so if we look at a, uh, a 2011 review, sorry for the typo, um, the first is, uh, is uh, Decimo, and I, I say that word sometimes and uh, people uh, do make that face, go, what are you talking about? <laughs> um, uh, it's a cool sounding word that is digital, social, and mobile, really combining into one. Um, uh, on-demand social shopping and the need for content. So let's talk about those ideas for a minute. And Jeanine, just want to make sure we're, we're being aware of any questions. So uh, talk to a lot of people today who really uh, are, are still thinking about digital, social, and mobile as separate activities. And the reality is um, devices such as the iPhone, um, pad devices uh, are really shattering what that is about. If you look at the, the um, lion's share 60% plus of social traffic now comes through a mobile device. We are, we are social when and where we are. Uh, we are, uh, uh, and we are mobile when and where we are. Uh, so there, there's a um, uh, access is, uh, is I was uh, discussing with some friends the other day. There's really not really uh, a reason to have esoteric arguments with your friends anymore because you have the world's knowledge in your pocket and we can settle arguments very quickly. Um, yeah, but if you think about, you know, that is, a, uh, is an interesting idea, uh, there is a, um, a huge connection that consumers are able to get data and, and information when and where they want from any source they want. We'll talk about some of those. You really saw those things coming together uh, as, as properties like Facebook and Twitter uh, really made heavy, you know, heavy pushes in making their mobile experiences uh, pretty seamless and easy. Many retailers, uh, you know, I, I think most major retailers now have some sort of shopping app uh, and, and mobile optimized sites are, are the norm rather than the, uh, rather than the exception. Think about on-demand social shopping. This was an interesting campaign that was run in the holiday season this year. Uh, Amazon ran a campaign that they would give you a $5 um, gift card or $5 discount off your order if you scanned an item while you were in a retail store. Um, this is the first shot across the bow of, uh, of really the, the idea of hijacking purchases along the, uh, along the path to purchase. Um, this made some people um, quite angry, as you can imagine, uh, because uh, it, it was really encouraging uh, price compared to shopping. But I, I think you know this is going to be the norm for consumers as, as the information is readily available to us. What was interesting about this at about the same time, a study came out that showed 42% of consumers, and this is U.S. data, 40% of consumers in the United States. Had, uh, had searched for a product while they were in a retail store and bought that product from another, uh, an, another retailer. So this is something that people are gonna have to contend with. Uh, there is uh, conversations about um, you know, Best Buy being an Amazon showroom. Uh, it's a very expensive uh, showroom mm -hmm. for, um, for Best Buy. Uh, mm -hmm. And, and it, it, will, it will really redefine uh, how, we, how we think about retail, I think, I think going forward, because retail will be uh, much closer to us through some type of device. Um, the, the other interesting thing that I, I think was, was ground shaking about this is, I was at a conference uh, earlier this year uh, a digital uh, technology investment conference, and it was pretty much uh, considered uh, um, a, a fact that Amazon will be the number two retailer in the world behind Walmart um, as soon as two years from now. So you think about that rate of growth and that attachment rate of growth, uh, it's pretty astounding. And, and 
The other interesting thing about this that we've been following too is seeing how many of the online retailers though are realizing that they have to go offline and are opening up these you know, fake storefronts where you can't buy anything, but you can prove showroom. That, yeah, <laughs> yeah, Amazon really is here. eBay, we're really here. Now go home and go online sure. and buy something. Sure, right? sure, yeah. sure. Um, Fiat did some of that. I thought it was very interesting. Mm -hmm. So when Fiat uh, launched the little 500, mm -hmm. uh, they would have a showroom with four or five cars in it. You couldn't actually buy a car there, right? But you spec a car that came in. I don't know, some ten thousand configurations or something. Um, uh, I guess you got the JLo edition or something, yeah. <laughs> and uh, and you were able to you know you were able to, to to pick that out. So so as you think about retail changing in different ways in the consumer's minds, we become uh, uh, much more comfortable buying mm -hmm. things in multi-channel mode. Um, I, I think that you'll see some some pretty significant changes. Um, I, I thought this was interesting too in, in thinking about uh, positioning of the Kindle Fire. As a uh, as a retail device, and um, we were meeting with QVC a couple weeks ago, and QVC has some data that as consumers are watching their shows, uh, eighty percent of them, fully eighty percent of their audience, is interacting with some type of device. Uh, so an iPad, a, um, a, a an iPhone, a computer. So there's a second screen that they're dealing with. So QVC has been very smart about this. Uh, they launched an iPad recently uh, for David Venable who's one of their celebrity chefs, and he has a show on Sundays on QVC. And the app only functions when the show is live. So the app is giving additional data and recipes, and, and <clears throat> you're able to talk live with the host, and QVC's got kind of a unique platform because they can talk back via the broadcast. So it's a very interesting way to think about how, how uh, the, the blending uh, of content of retail and, and of, of social connection because you're also able to talk to uh, other mem other people who might be watching the show at the same time. Uh, the Kindle Fire, I think, is, is really targeted at that same activity is I now have this open portal to uh, a retailer at all times. And I may be reading a book. I may be, you know, I, th I think about um, my propensity to spend um, uh, lots of uh, un, unintended dollars on iTunes just because it, it is always on, it mm -hmm. is always easy. And once I've entered my password once, I may as well buy 10 songs, right? Because I, it, it's easy. Uh, I have a six-year-old daughter and she asks me often uh, what my password is for iTunes and uh, I, I uh, am not forthcoming with that information. Uh, <laughs> but, but, I, but I think as you think about this removing friction from the retail, the retail system, it was a big trend in, in 2011 and, and I think we'll, we'll see a lot of it in 2012. And, and this is something that I just find fascinating. Um, I don't know if anybody has a, a toothbrush uh, subscription yet. Uh, but but Amazon uh, has created the ability to subscribe to products, and so when you think about uh, utility purchases like toothpaste and toilet paper and uh, laundry detergent and things that probably most consumers don't change the brand that they buy very often, uh, you can set that up on a replenishment uh, from Amazon today. And at prices which are, you know, if you have Amazon Prime, uh, there's no shipping involved, so there are prices at, at which, uh, which are competitive to what you would be paying in retail. Um, if you think about this as a, a process for a, a larger consumables play, uh, I think it's, it's pretty interesting. And um, in fact, one of my colleagues was noticing that a, uh, an executive from a large grocery chain that we know had just been hired by Amazon. I think they're very focused in this in this space, and this will be a place that they're targeting. Um, it's uh, they, they they don't aren't disclosing uh, specifically, but uh, Amazon is now a top five um, uh, is a, is a top five seller of Pampers, um, and and they're probably number two. Uh, and so when you think about that volume going, you know, going through that system, that's a pretty radical change in just a short time. Uh, and, and I, it, you know, as I tell my wife, um, why do we spend time thinking about buying toilet paper or, or uh, it, you know, commodity purchases that is valuable headspace we could be using for Angry Birds? <laughs> and and, and, and we, all, we all need more time. 
Uh, the other thing is the is really the need for engaging content. Um, you know, chipmunks on skateboards or, or is that a chipmunk or a squirrel uh, are are really interesting. Uh, I'm just not sure that that uh, long term they're that engaging. You know, this is a, this is a cute way though of of thinking about. Uh, many of us remember our our content challenges that we had in the late '90s and the early 2000s when we had a website, right? And thanks to social, we now have the equivalency of 10 websites, or 20 websites, or 30 websites. Uh, how can you possibly begin to manage the content that is going through these streams? And you saw a lot of folks really dealing with this because most people had, had gotten their Facebook and their, their Twitter plays in action, and they had run some, some contests, and they had done some stuff, all great stuff. Uh, but it, you know, when you wake up, um, the next morning, and the morning after, and the morning after, and all of a sudden, eight days have gone by, and there's been no con there's been no content coming from the brand or the retailer side. Um, it, it, it is a, it's a hole, and, and people are I think are struggling with how do I manage this ecosystem. Um, we believe that that engaging with consumer content is critical. Uh, consumers will not just create content on your Facebook page. Um, uh, uh, or organically if there's nothing for them, no reason for them to do so. So do you think any retailers or brands in 2011 did this well? Had enough engaging content that it kept people coming back to their site on a weekly basis? Yeah, I think, um, you, you know, that's a great question. I, I think everyone is, is sort of trying different scenarios and tactics. Um, I, I think one of, the, um, one of the best examples that we saw oh. Uh oh, which was actually a. Uh, did we die? Or did that die? All right. <laughs> That's not me. Uh, one one of the examples that we one of the best examples we saw uh, was actually a client, um, and I, I wish we could take credit for all the content, but actually they were very very mm -hmm. great. The content was a, a company called Murphy USA, and Murphy USA is a convenience store retailer in the states. Um, they're they're commonly thought of as Walmart gas because about uh, uh, ninety percent of their locations are actually in the parking lot of a Walmart store, but it is actually an independent company. Um, if you can create engaging content around a kiosk-based gas station, you can you're mm -hmm. doing a pretty good good job in <laughs> making mm -hmm. content. I mean, there there are uh, you, you know I think of a fashion brand or a beauty brand or a food brand having a lot more opportunity than. Uh, hey, gas is pretty cheap today. And by the way, while you're there, pick up some Kit Kats. Uh, you know, uh, being being uh, a content, but they they were very smart about content because they engaged a community to help them. So each week they were having stories from moms on how Murphy helped them live their lives. So it might be, stop by. I've got to go to. You know, I've got to drop uh, somebody off at soccer and somebody off at music practice, and and, and I can get by and get some Gatorade, I can get by and get some, some water, I can get by and, and get uh, maybe not healthy snacks, whatever, you know, mm -hmm. but, but it, it, it's a story or going to a, a tailgate or whatever. It, it was content that was associated and it, and it was content that they were using in a very smart way through storytelling. That was, uh, that's a good question. Um, so let's talk about 2012 and, and where we're going. I think there's, there's um, uh, as Jeannie mentioned, there's a post that went up on uh, collectivebias.com uh, today that is, is the 12 trends for 2012. We'll really drill down to six here. Um, six big ideas. Self-expression has become a big idea. And if you think about what, what Twitter is and what Facebook is, but, but then as you morph into things like Pinterest and Instagram and um, Oink, I don't know if anybody's used Oink Builder yet, uh, this idea of expression becomes very powerful and, and, and essentially making expression very easy. You know, the barriers to being a publisher today are non-existent. You know, if you're creating a Twitter stream, you're a publisher, you know. Uh, you, you may be a good publisher, you may be a bad publisher, but you're a publisher, you know. Uh, search from other platforms, you know, when as content becomes, it gets aggregated on things like Twitter and Facebook and, and Pinterest and other sites, um, search opportunities exist. Uh, the, the really rise in, in uh, connection of location, we'll talk a little bit about, about that. Um, discount fatigue, I, I think, is, a, is going to be a big trend this year in, uh, in 2012. Uh, analytics and measurement, you know, the number one question that, that we are asked as we do uh, any type of activity uh, is how do you measure this? How does, how does this, uh, 
how, how does this impact sales? How does it impact ROI? The investments that I'm making here, how do, how do I measure those? We'll talk a little bit about that and talk about organic SEO. Anything else? No, that's great. Okay, great. So let's talk about self-expression for a minute. Um, Pinterest has become a, a, an overnight phenomena in terms of self-expression, and, and self-expression in a couple ways. One through things that uh, that I may have created, that, that the user may have created. You know, so so I might be a crafter, I might be a photographer, I might be a foodie, uh, what, whatever. I might like to read books, whatever that is. Um, I'm able to share those in a very visible way through through a digital pen board, right? Um, the, there's also the, the self-expression of resharing things that other people like me have shared. What makes Pinterest very easy is I can make different points of view on things that I'm interested in uh, using a blend of my content, of my friends and my network's content, and of branded content. And, and it just becomes a very interesting way to, to display um, uh, content and it, it turns everybody into expression. The reason we really started paying attention to Pinterest in, in 2011 uh, is we saw so many people, uh, these, these 1,200 members of our community, begin to use it overnight and begin to add it into the content streams that they were producing in blogs. Well, we also like it, and you'll see in this, this small example of searching um, uh, macaroni and cheese, is if you think about it as a way that the shopper could access information along the path to purchase, it's pretty incredible. Mm -hmm. So if I am at a, uh, a retailer and I'm thinking I've got the 4 p.m. problem that we all talk mm -hmm. about of what's for dinner, um, this is a really easy way to find out that, that I, can, I can parse through um, content coming from many streams and I can choose something that looks great and that could come from uh, it could come from a branded site, it could come from a retailer site, but much more likely it's going to come from a blog or a consumer site as well. So we believe Pinterest and other forms of self-expression uh, uh, self and content aggregation will, will become important this year, and you'll see those uh, be integrated in a lot of activities. We also think that um, this type of self-expression is an amazing traffic driver. So uh, we, we operate a very robust pen board for, um, for Elmer's. And as part of that, uh, we're producing content each week. We go back to this content problem about, crea about creativity. And that creativity really uh, connected to what's going on in mom's mind at, at, at different parts of the, the year and the season and what's going on in the retailer's mind, in this case, Walmart in the US. Uh, and if you see already, if you look at the traffic, this, this information is coming from Alexa.com. Uh, uh, if you look at the traffic that's being driven to Elmers.com, a full 4% uh, of the traffic is already being driven by Pinterest, coming, coming from those Pinterest pages. So it's having a, you know, it's a top 10 driver mm -hmm. for, uh, for the site. Uh, beating uh, out Twitter. Be, beating out Twitter, which is, which is pretty interesting. Um, and, and I think the more content that gets produced, the more that, that, that gets shared, uh, the, the higher those rates can, can be. And there's an opportunity to blend that content on your site as well and then connect back through that. Right? So maybe before we move on from here, I'm going to launch one of the polls. And we're going to ask the question around um, what, what social platform is going to be most important for brands in 2012. So if you guys want to, everyone who's participating, select one of the following and we'll um, just give you about 30 seconds for this. We'll do a quick poll and I'll let you know what the results are. But maybe while we're talking about this, John, if you want to um, just talk about these kind of aggregation sites and what is a brand or a retailer to do with this? I mean, this is a perfect example of where you know, you can be fearful of that loss of control because you've put it out there. You don't control an aggregator site. Sure. Um, so, so there's there's two points of view on that. Actually, a brand could could create its own Pinterest page that it had full control of, and and it could have you could have you could have multiple pages. So you could have a. a, a complete brand page that's completely controlled by the brand. You could have a blended page that's controlled by a brand and, and different users, or you could have a completely open page. Mm -hmm. and, and, and I think um, uh, brands will probably experiment with all three and, and to understand what really makes sense. But I think if you really want to capture the, uh, the, the, the power 
of, of what um, getting consumers engaged with your brand, you need to be open to that idea. Mm -hmm. you, need to, you need to be uh, 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 receptive to the idea of, uh, gosh, what, what more sincere form of flattery for a brand to have people um, sharing uh, their um, 2 p.m. Uh, Coke Zero break that right. they take every day. Mm -hmm. yeah. you know, and in the different ways that they do it, not yeah. just you know, here's my Coke Zero, but here are my feet up on the desk, and here's what it you know what it really means to mm -hmm. me, or however you may do that. Mm -hmm. um, That's great. Yeah. So um, interesting for the poll results. Then we've got 36% um, of people said that it would be Facebook. 27% selected Pinterest and Google Plus, and Twitter were tied at 18. With poor four square of zero. <laughs> zero. Location gets no love. And, and, and uh, it, it's, uh, it, it's sad because I think for, uh, I think especially for shopper marketers, location just has so much promise. But maybe not ready for prime time yet. We'll find out. Um, search from other platforms. I also think this is, this is a big trend. Um, I was um, uh, discussing with some friends last year or, or some colleagues the, the idea that I was watching a news event via Twitter. And they said, what do you mean? And I said, well, you know, here was an emerging news event. And, and so I just put in a hashtag of, of the event and I watched it via Twitter. And they're like, well, don't you want to go to the, you know, the New York Times or to Fox News or, you know, you know all, these, all these news sources or get a blend? And I said, well, actually, um, they're tweeting. So by, you know, by using this hashtag, I'm getting all of them. You know, and it's interesting. And what was what was even more interesting was um, they were using tweets in their newscasts. So Twitter was actually becoming part of the content stream. So I'm like, huh, this is interesting. And and I noticed, uh, you know, a big trend uh, and of people moving to the idea of information recency being valued. And in fact. Uh, you'll probably recall in, in October or so of last year, Google made a pretty significant change to its algorithm to begin favoring more recent content, uh, uh, ma making that uh, more important in the way that Google search returns were, were, um, were returned. Uh, I use a, a blend of both, as I think many consumers are starting to do. I like to do a Google search and I like to do a Twitter search on the same thing because then I can get the content that Google deems important and I can get the content that people deem important. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting to see the, the comparison mm -hmm. uh, of, those, of those two things. Uh, we call it twoogling uh, <laughs> and, and thinking about how that information goes together. But if you think about the content aggregation that we were just discussing, you know, Pinterest is a search engine, right? Uh, uh, Facebook a little wonkier, but it's a search engine, you know. And, and what, what's interesting is each one is going to return different sets of data and, and in, in data that can be used in different ways. And I, and I think as you start thinking about how this applies to Shopper, um, I may, as a shopper, use Twitter to find new and exciting items in a, uh, a, a trip to, uh, uh, to my retailer. Um, uh, I, or I may Twitter... Uh, I may use Twitter as a as a live uh, crowdsource uh, to search for information. You know, hey, uh, what's new? I'm bored with dinner. What's new and exciting? Right? You'd probably get a response to that from your network, and, and it would probably be um, somewhat funny and somewhat interesting, you know, <laughs> depending on your friends. Um, sorry for the redaction on Path, but as you know, um, mm -hmm. there was a big fight going on in the states on. Uh, the SOPA loss, which uh, I think the uh, the internet won, uh, it seems. <laughs> and so, so um, location 2.0. Read a lot of stories last year about how location uh, was dead. <laughs> it's done. Uh, the only I read a great article about the only last survivor of location uh, being Foursquare, with uh, you know Guala being purchased by uh, Facebook and, and its service being shut down, Whirl being purchased by Groupon and its service being shut down, and and some of the other services are, are just nowhere to be found. Um, uh, evidently, uh, the writer had not checked out uh, the new crop of, of location services that are, that are coming and how they develop. Uh, there was a good article um, just this morning about PATH. I uh, just received another, um, uh, I think their total financing now is up to 11 million, so they just received another round of financing. Uh, this is, in, in my humble opinion, uh, the, the best evolution of location to date. 
because it, it really allows for location-based content to be aggregated. So we are having a dinner last night, and we're able to easily share a combination of um, pictures of our food, which I know everybody's starting to see, um, uh, of videos, of check-ins, uh, uh, of thoughts, and, and share it with um, either close-knit audiences or large broadcast audiences. And there's really, you, you can really choose everything quite quickly and easily through the, uh, through the app itself. Um, adding some, some other type of location sharing about what I'm listening to right mm -hmm. now, and I can actually purchase the songs that my, my friends might be listening to, really see that functionality being able to, to, to develop as, as it comes along. So um, uh, I, I don't think location's dead yet, but I, I think it's going to morph into, into other activities. So for some of the brands on the phone with us now, how are they going to benefit from something like Path? It's a great, great question. Um, <clears throat> so um, it, from our own experience, uh, we love location because it allows us to document the path to purchase. Mm -hmm. um, and path is another way now we are starting to do that. So uh, we might use path in, in a path to purchase that is going to be a larger event. So if you thought about maybe um, taking a cruise, if you thought about uh, attending a sporting event, something that's going to be spread out over time that, that you might, but you, you could make that quickly um, applicable to a, uh, a shopping trip, mm -hmm. you know. So, so what is my summer grilling shopping trip, and right. what is that? Or maybe path? getting ready for a holiday dinner, that sort of thing. It's a bit right. longer. Yeah. And, and, well, it's longer, but I'm also capturing uh, my my prep, mm -hmm. um, uh, maybe some of my interaction about the event. So I'm reminding my friends, hey, don't forget we're having a, uh, a, a barbecue tonight, mm -hmm. uh, and then the actual content from the event itself. That's now all blended together. Um, I think that becomes very interesting from a brand. One, understanding the process, but two, then where are the engagement points along the process that, that I could actually uh, uh, play as a brand? Mm -hmm. uh, how, how if I am, uh, how if I'm a ConAgra as the as the the grill is lit? You know, how do I become helpful in? in Gosh, what could I do to actually not burn my chicken today, and actually make and actually make that tasty? I don't know what you know what those streams are, um, but but I, I I think it's I, I think it's got a lot of application, especially in the in the shopper sphere mm -hmm. and, and understanding what those those uh, those touch points are. Um, discount fatigue. This was this was kind of interesting. There was a, a pretty interesting article uh late in the year talking about uh, the decline in in traffic for both groupon and uh, living social um both are still continue to tweak their models and and, and are, are really pretty effective at, at I mean, if you you want to drive some type of activity this will do it um but i uh, as a good friend of mine ted rubin says um, you don't have to be a genius to give away things at, at half off and, and get, get reaction to it. And it's more like 75% off because you've got to split the fee with, uh, with Groupon. Um, I, I think uh, the, the issue with, with discounting becomes um, there, uh, there is now no barrier to discounts. So the ability to drive targeted behavior comes much harder. And the likelihood of you just um, uh, giving away margin to a disloyal customer it is is uh, it is quite high. So I gave I gave the example. I think we were talking about yesterday. I, I recently purchased some some shoes from Tom's and uh, great shoes, great calls. Love the brand. Purchased a couple pairs for my daughter. Purchased a pair for me. And as I was getting ready to check out, I'm like, oh, I gotta get a discount, right? Um, so I Googled Tom's discount and I was able to find a. Uh, a uh, $15 discount if I bought more than $100, right? So I was going to pay full price, and I, uh, and Tom's just lost $15 in margin. Um, it, it's a uh, it, it's a, a tough problem that, that people are going to have to figure out uh, as as digital offers tend to, to mm -hmm. become ubiquitous quite quite often. And then I think consumers are just absolutely bombarded with offers at at all points, and and it just becomes overwhelming um, uh, many of us I'll, I'll date myself but many of us can remember the days of um, 30 to 40 percent email open rates right and that's because you know email is new and oh my gosh I'm getting 20 percent off at Banana Republic they email me three times a day mm -hmm. <laughs> I, mean, I got it it's on discount you have trained me to not pay full price yeah. and, and I think that's uh, uh, that's something that 
that brands are going to have to, to, to figure out. Um, let's talk about analytics and, and social management um, for a minute and, and think about uh, for a minute, um, how are we measuring this? You, you know, uh, how, how, are we, uh, how are we beginning to assess? Um, many of you may be familiar with clout, some of you, you might not. Um, uh, clout's a, a simple scoring mechanism that basically anything with a Twitter handle and, and any kind of term now can really be scored. Um, is this score valid? Uh, I do not know, right? Um, I, I know that people, however, are paying attention to it. I give a great example. I speak to a lot of, uh, of um, college students and marketers, marketing students and public relations students, marketing communication students. And uh, as I was doing some research for a, 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 a talk at Penn State a, a couple months ago, uh, I just went out and, and went on Monster and looked at some of the job job postings, job descriptions. What kind of jobs are these folks looking at when they when they get out of school? And what I noticed was about half of the job descriptions had a minimum clout score uh, listed in the job description for um, jobs that were, especially any type of social jobs, mm -hmm. but even just some of the standard marketing communications jobs. And I'm like, hmm. Well, I don't know if clout matters, but if I was uh, a, a, a senior in, in college, I sure would be uh, paying attention to mm -hmm. what my clout score is if it's going to keep me from getting a job. Yeah. Why don't I um, I'll launch the poll here and see, of all the people on the phone, how many of you know what your company's clout or even perhaps your personal clout score is? So I'm going to launch that poll now, and why don't you uh, continue telling us a bit more about it? Sure. Uh, I think something else that is, is very <laughs> interesting with clout as well is... Um, uh, the, the travel and tourism industry has embraced this pretty quickly. And there are a lot of not only anecdotal stories, but, but, but um, articles now about airlines, hotels uh, that are offering um, first class upgrades, offering room upgrades to people with specific clout scores. Um, and and uh, I, I think that's interesting. I mean, is, is, that, is that, you know, again, with this, with this analytics piece, we're, you, you know, we, We've, um, we've gone through other media where we've learned to, to have accepted measurements. Mm -hmm. So we had Nielsen for TV, and you know, we, had, we had other measurements for radio and, and for, for print. Um, the, the, uh, the social space, I don't think, has a, a, a clear leader yet. You think about Radian 6, and you think about some of the other properties. They do a nice job. Uh, but what does, uh, you know, the, the key order winners are going to come when you can take uh, a Radian 6 measurement like share of voice and you can translate that into a, a sales impact, right? So if you, think about, um, if you think about if I can measure my share of voice and I can measure the delta, the change in my share of voice and, and link that to a sales impact, uh, I, I think the space will get, will, will get very serious mm -hmm. very quick. Um, we tend to measure uh, two sets of things. So we measure the things that, that we've always measured in marketing because we want to be able to, I mean, at the end of the day, um, social media is just another form of media. So it, it, is it more efficient or less efficient than the, the things that I'm currently buying? If print, TV, radio, digital display, email market, whatever, uh, delivers better, better rates of return than social, then, then you, you make some sort of, mm -hmm. of judgment call about what your media mix is. As we, as we begin to not think about this as something special, but just another way to engage people and begin to measure those paths, um, that those dollars will take care of themselves. So thinking about things like impressions, reach, uh, you know, sentiment, uh, you know, some of the things that we measure in, in traditional media and then adding on things like share of voice, Google rank, um, you know, the amount of content that exists, uh, are, are things that we can all measure now and things that we can dashboard. And, and my suggestion to, to most brands today is to really monthly set up that dashboard. I mean, it's, it's very, you know, there's no special skills needed to do it. We can all uh, go to clout.com, type in our brand name, and, and yes. here's our clout score. And we can track that over time, you know, and, and, and it's, uh, it's a great visual exercise. I know our, um, our Murphy client, um, uh, did that for about 20 different metrics. How many Facebook fans do we have? How many Twitter fans do we have? Um, what's our cloud score? 
what's our Google rank? And, and they, uh, they just simply printed them out and uh, had posted them down a hallway where most of their employees uh, were trafficked at some point in the day. So it was just an awareness building mm -hmm. thing to begin with. So I think that it's probably something that we should all do because respondents had 82% not knowing Cloud Score. And again, I don't want to be the, uh, uh, I, I am not the uh, proponent or, <laughs> or the critic of clout, uh, but it is a measurement system that, that uh, at least is comparative. Mm -hmm. You know, we can, we can today go and, and uh, compare, compare clout scores of Coke and Pepsi and of Walmart and Target and of, uh, uh, you know, different brands to, to, to understand what their, what their engagement is uh, according to this one mm -hmm. algorithm. Um, and it, the last thing, we really think about a lot about organic SEO, and this is an example from a, a client of ours in the States, uh, Tyson Chicken. And when, when we think about the ways that you can begin to reach people, as, as you know, especially in the search environment, which, which becomes a major way that we're, we're all gathering information today. Um, you know, pay-per-click is, 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 a, is a valuable tool. It's a trusted tool. We can measure it. We know what it does. Um, organic content is, is, is super important. And, and I think you go back to that idea of one of the, the challenges for social media is that content production. You know, if you can really figure out a great user-generated content strategy, uh, it is a great way to affect this. And, and this is a great example of a, a campaign we're, at, we're actually still in where um, both the social fabric community um, and, and some, of the, uh, some of the connected content that they're producing are really driving outside, uh, outside uh, uh, results and, and traffic streams for Tyson. Um, this is probably one of the most important things to pay attention to uh, is, is paid links. And, and paid links have become very popular uh, in, the, in the blogging space. Um, paid paid links are you, you you know and paid links can include sponsored blog posts, product reviews, anything like that. Um, it, it's uh, it's fine to use paid links. Uh, the the key is really using a no follow tag uh, with that link. And uh, your your SEO people, if you're not familiar with that, your SEO people folks can can help you with that. But Google has no problem with you using paid links as long as you. Um, as long as you're using that nofollow tag, that just tells the Google search engine not to uh, not to index that link. Um, Google's very serious about this. Uh, Google really uh, recently put its uh, its Chrome service on probation uh, by uh, because it had found out that a company that it had used had used paid links, and Google just enforced its policy. So I think that's making a statement. This this just happened recently. I think that's making a statement. If we're if uh, if they're going to, uh, to, to punish themselves in the space, they're, they're going to do it to, to other brands. And, and it's, it's very important that people, that people do that. So if there are uh, questions, I'm happy to, um, to, to uh, field those via whatever your preferred uh, method of uh, communication is. And I appreciate uh, the opportunity to speak to everybody. Yeah, today. no, thank you. And actually, we did get one question mm -hmm. that came in just about clout. Um, the question was, what is considered a good clout score? I know you did share a story uh, with us yesterday about Ted and how he gets uh, room upgrades because of his clout score. But we can share that. We can all aim for that and all get the free drinks at the hotel. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, the, the, only, the only anecdotal evidence I, I really have on what a good clout score is, you know, the highest clout scores I tend to see, unless you're Justin Bieber or somebody, is, are in the uh, high 60s or 70 range. Uh, I think there was an article about um, Bieber had higher clout than Obama, uh, which that Bieber probably has more Actually. engagement than yeah. <laughs> Obama across the, the nation. Um, that's a statement that I'm not sure what that means. Uh, but uh, I know there are a lot of nightclubs in New York uh, that uh, don't allow people in uh, now with less than a 50 cloud score. Uh, All right, so so I, I don't know if that is the level, but... Um. So for our person who asked the question, congratulations, you can get into all New York. <laughs> All right, that's <laughs> with great. With your 53, so that's great. All right, that's great. Well, thanks so much, John, for coming up and sharing all this with us. And thank you to everybody on the phone. It was really great. Thanks for answering the polls. And we'll be posting um, the slide share as well as the video on our website. Look for it on Twitter and Facebook and LinkedIn. And uh, thanks again for everyone for, uh, for joining us today.